Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to be with you. And as we come to God's word, I was thinking that you can, you can try as much as you like to run away from God, but we serve an omnipresent, omniscient God. So, so where are you gonna run? You know, I, I think of what David said in Psalm 139. If I, if I make, go up to the heights, uh, God is there. And if I make my bed in the depths, Lord, you are there. Where, where can I flee from God's presence? And that's, that's the amazing thing. You can't outrun God. And, and, and this morning we want to pack, uh, unpack the story of a man who was running away. And I guess maybe in some sense he even thought that he was running away from, from God. And yet, in hindsight, as he looks back, he realizes that he actually was running towards God. And that might be you here this morning, thinking you're running away, but God and his sovereignty uh, is always pursuing us. And so we're continuing, as Brett said, with our series called God's Forgotten Postcards, and uh, looking at the shortest, most forgotten books of the Bible, and today, we're coming to look at the book of Philemon or Philemon, or however you want to pronounce it. Uh, that doesn't really matter. Uh, it's the only personal letter that we have from the Apostle Paul in the whole of the New Testament. So Paul must have written other personal letters, but God in his sovereignty has preserved this one for us. So what's a bit of background? Well, the book is about Onesimus, and Onesimus is a slave. He's a slave who has run away from his master, Philemon. And it seems like Onesimus may have stolen money from his master Philemon um, to get to Rome. It was quite a distance to go from Colossae, where he is from, to get to Rome, and so maybe somehow his master funded that by him stealing from him. And so he hopes to go to Rome, because that's the capital. Crowds of people, he can be anonymous, he can blend in, he can disappear, he can go under the radar uh, and hopefully preserve his freedom. But God has an amazing plan for Onesimus, which he doesn't realize. In Rome, he meets the Apostle Paul. We don't know how they met. Was it random? Did he seek out the Apostle Paul? We don't know, but Paul at the time is in prison. He's under house arrest in a rented house in Rome. That means he would have had some freedoms, but he was essentially chained to two Praetorian guards all of the time. So it meant people could come and visit him. What a blessing to write letters to the churches during that period. What a blessing to have Christian leaders visit Paul and give him input. He wasn't just gonna sit around and mope. Uh, and as one pastor I heard preach uh, said that, that with these two guards, they probably had no choice but to pray whenever Paul wanted to pray. So when he went down to pray, they, they were forced to pray with him. And there's a sense as you read the book of Philippians that uh, God was even at work. Um, he, he, God's name had become known through the Praetorian, the palace God. So, 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 so Paul just had this love for meeting with people and sharing the gospel. But in the Roman Empire, we need to understand as it was in New World slavery, that a slave was not a person, but a thing. A possession without a name, without a background, without an identity, without possessions, just stripped of their humanity. Aristotle, who lived before New Testament times, even described a slave in this way. He described a slave in a letter about friendship. And he spoke about friendship and said you can't have friendship with an ox and with a donkey, and he listed animals, and at the end he even puts a slave. And he describes a slave as a living tool. And he says, a tool on its own is an inanimate slave. How dehumanizing to know that the slave's only function is to be a tool that is living. And in fact, just an ordinary tool, a hammer, a screwdriver, whatever it is, is actually just a slave that hasn't been animated and brought to life so it can serve me. It's a, it's, uh, you, know, as you look at history and you think about the legacy of slavery, but we see that as Onesimus goes to Rome now, he's not just a slave, he's a runaway slave. That, that ranks him down if you can even rank further down. Because it was forbidden in Rome to harbor runaway slaves. And he's now a fugitive. And if he got caught, he would have been whipped, he would have been beaten, he could even be crucified by his master if that's what his master wanted to do. And if he returned home, his master could do this because Roman law said there's no problem if you want to do this to your fugitive slave and that is to take a hot iron brand and to brand his forehead with the three letters F-U-G which stands in the Latin for fugitivus which means fugitive. 
Just imagine being a slave and having that branding on you for the rest of your life. That's your identity. Some slaves had collars put around them like as though they were dogs with kind of return to, to this owner. But God has a way of pursuing us with grace and, and how much more so those who are runaways, Adam and Eve and Jonah and the prodigal son and we could go on and Anesimus meets Paul who shares the gospel with him and leads him to Christ. Perhaps Paul didn't even know that Anesimus was originally a runaway slave. Maybe he just met him. Maybe Anesimus kept that part quiet. We don't know. But Anesimus comes from the city of Colossae and we know that from Colossians 4.9 and one day a man by the name of Epaphras who also comes from Colossae, and we also know that from the book of Colossians, comes to visit Paul in prison. He's from the same hometown where, where, where Nesimus serves his master Philemon. And as Epaphras comes and, 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 and meets with Paul, I like to imagine that suddenly he just looks at Nesimus who's maybe there with Paul and says, don't I know you from somewhere? I mean, these towns weren't that big. And then it dawns on him, hang on a minute, aren't you the slave of Philemon, the Colossian church met in Philemon's home. He was the host for that local church and so maybe Epaphras said, I think I've seen the slave before. He's been serving us, I've seen him around the house. Aren't you the slave, what are you doing here? And maybe, we don't know. Maybe Onesimus realizes I've got to come clean now. I need to be honest, my cover is blown. And so it places the apostle Paul in a dilemma. Under Roman law, it is a crime for the Apostle Paul to keep this slave. And so Paul decides to send Onesimus back to Philemon, but with a letter, a letter. And the other thing the Apostle Paul does is he doesn't send him alone. It's as though he sends the slave with a bodyguard. He says, yeah, I wanna send back this brother, Tychicus, with you. And he will go with you back to Colossae. And this is the amazing thing. He doesn't just send Onesimus with a small little postcard for Philemon, his boss. He also sends the letter that we know as the book of Colossians. So these two letters go back with Tychicus and with Onesimus to Colossae. And you can read a little bit about that in Colossians 4, seven to nine. Now use your imagination. I imagine Onesimus arriving at his master's house with Tychicus there. Maybe Tychicus went in first, we don't know. And, And as Philemon opens the front door, Horror of horror, shock of shocks. Here's his runaway slave who he thought he'd never see again. And, and imagine Anesimus now falling to his knees and handing Philemon this letter called Philemon. And so I want you to turn there with me. It's on page 206 in the New Testament. Page 206. I'm gonna have the verses up as we go through. And I wanna expound this in the way that the letter, I think, was designed to be expounded. We'll take it verse by verse. Maybe just as an interesting exercise, as a show of hands, who, maybe you've been doing some reading now, but before that reading or before today, who, who would be honest and say, I don't have a clue what this book is about? God's forgotten postcard. Yeah, lots of hands. Let's see the hands for Obadiah last week. Even more. So we're doing a good thing. Good thing. So let's look at verse one. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. Paul introduces himself not as the apostle of Christ. That's what he does in the book to the Colossians, the letter to them. That's what he does in other New Testament letters. But here, he he leaves out his apostolic authority and he just introduces himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Why? Why? Because he's writing to his friend Philemon, he doesn't want to browbeat him, he doesn't want to rub in his face that, hey, I'm the authoritative apostle. This is a warm letter. This is probably one of the warmest, most personal letters that has been preserved for us in history out of all the letters that we're aware of, and yet this is in uh, the word of God. And so he says as well that Timothy is his companion with him, And Paul's letter to Philemon, the appeal that he's gonna make to him that we're gonna come to see, comes out of a place of himself having to sacrifice for the gospel. He's not gonna ask Philemon to do anything that he is not doing. Paul is suffering huge loss for the gospel in prison. And I believe, brothers and sisters, that Paul's circumstances shout out to us today. And Paul's life, that title is saying, what are you willing to sacrifice 
for the gospel. Now we can think about that in a very general thing, but when it gets specific and we call to sacrifice something, that's when it's maybe a lot harder. So I have to say, are you willing to lay down your rights and your preferences and your privileges for the gospel like the Lord Jesus Christ did? And so he addresses this letter to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, verse two, to Apphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier. Now, scholars believe that, that Apphia was Philemon's wife, so it was kind of, he was greeting, hey, hey Philemon, I wanna greet you, you are a Christian, you're a, a fellow worker with me, and please say hi to your wife as well, and also to your son. Scholars believe that Archippus was probably Philemon's son, We know from Colossians 4.17 that he may have even been a young leader in the Colossian church that met in their home. Because we see that the next part says, and to the church that meets in your home. Philemon must have been a wealthy man to accommodate the whole church in his home, must have been a home of some size to be able to provide the entertainment and the eats and the sandwiches. I don't know if they had samosas and spring rolls like we sometimes have here, but... um, He had the wealth and the resources to do that. Maybe he had more than one slave as a wealthy man. And so Paul includes the house church in this letter because churches didn't meet in buildings. They didn't have the funds. They met in homes. He includes this house church because they're part of the family. They meet there. They know who Onesimus is. Maybe they need to be aware of the way they've been treating him, how they viewed him. And they need to know what's happened to this runaway slave, especially now that he's come back. It kind of has hints in my mind of the story of the prodigal son. And then Paul greets them in verse three. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He begins with grace, he begins with the gospel here, and he ends with grace. Because we need grace and Philemon needs grace if he wants to obey what Paul is about to put before him. And then verse four. He now begins to commend Philemon, for what he's seen in his life as a Christian. He says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. You know what, Philemon, every time believers visit me from Asia, whether it's Tychicus, whether it's Epaphras, as people come into my home, I'm only hearing good stuff about you. Your generosity, as people are in need, you help them. The fact that I hear about your home that is open, that you're a blessing to the church there, This is really encouraging and and every time I pray for the church and I pray for various leaders, I make sure that I pray for you, Philemon. And then Paul says in verse six, and I've taken this from the New Living Translation. It's actually one of the toughest verses in the whole of the New Testament to translate and it's a better translation than the NIV. Paul says, and I'm praying for you. I'm praying, Philemon, that you will put into action the generosity That comes from your faith. It doesn't just come because you're a good guy and you're different, but it actually is rooted in your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Philemon, it's your identity in Christ that should make a difference in how you live, in how you treat people. It's it's security in the gospel that should change your life and that as you do that, you'll understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. And then Paul carries on in verse seven and says, your love. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Philemon, you've been one of those who has continually encouraged me. And the word he uses for heart here is the way that the Greeks understood emotions. It's not heart, do you know what the word is? It's bowels. You have refreshed my bowels, brother. I mean, in those days, that's how you told your girlfriend you loved her, I love you with all of my bowels. It's like. Wouldn't half your bowels be better than all of your bowels, but leave that aside. But brother, you've refreshed my bowels. It's, it's, you know, who needs some special yogurt? Brother, you've refreshed my bowels. But, but it sounds humorous in our culture, but he's saying you've refreshed my heart. You're not one of those people that drains me, that sucks the life out of me when I see you coming. I think, oh no. No, you've refreshed my heart. It's a joy to be around you. You you supply me with energy. Your your generosity encourages me. You're not one one who complains all the time and sows disunity and I have to call out because you're preaching heresy. You've refreshed the brothers and mine. And then verse eight. There's a connecting word here in verse eight, therefore. And what Paul is doing now, having commended Philemon, he's now making a connection. He's saying, therefore, in the light of who you are in Christ, 
in the light of these great qualities that I've seen. Therefore, Philemon, I'm gonna ask you to do something now on this side that is gonna have to do with Onesimus, but I'm not asking you to do anything for Onesimus that you haven't done for other people, because why? It's easy to do it for people you like, people who you think are your equals, people who are your family. When we think about the subject of racism and we call people to love here, you, you know what it is to love, you know what it is to respect, because you can do that. So I'm not asking you to do anything, I'm asking you to think about the person on this side maybe in a different way. Therefore, so he says, therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and I could order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. And we still don't know what his appeal is gonna be. That's how beautiful and just tactful this letter is. It's just a slow revealing of things. And Paul is saying to him, I'm an apostle. I could demand you to do what I say. I could command you, I'm the apostle. But I want you to do what is right voluntarily from your own heart so it's genuine. I want you to look back, Philemon, at your track record. I want you to look back at your love for the gospel. And I want that to be the basis. I could pull rank on you. I could get you to comply. Of course I could do that. But it won't win your heart. It won't pursue your heart, it won't change your heart. I want you to obey from the heart. And friends, there's a great sermon here. A great lesson for us as parents, as we deal with our kids. Just toe the line, do what I say. There's a great lesson for bosses, employers and employees, and how we treat our employees. There's a lesson here for pastors, and how we treat members of our congregation, and how we respond to tough people. There's great lessons here, and Paul models for us just beautiful tactfulness. It's not the kind of Paul that we used to seeing, and, and I'm glad we've got this letter because people say, ah, oh, Paul's just this fighter for the truth, but here we see relational warm Paul. You see, our natural bent towards self and selfishness doesn't go away when we become a Christian. It still continues to haunt us. In fact, I often say at weddings that, that marriage, my marriage has been the thing probably more than anything else that has exposed the selfishness of my heart. And it's still there and still an ongoing process of sanctification. And as a church, we can easily default just to self again. But as a church, we long to grow in being outward. We long to grow in gospel reconciliation. We long to grow in unity in diversity. Those two things together, it's not just diversity, it's unity in diversity. But the danger is that our natural bent will just default and say, well, how's this gonna affect me? and our heart's not changed. Will this make me uncomfortable? Will I be forced to do things externally that I don't wanna do? Will I have to give up what I prefer? And we have this inherent selfish entitlement, but the ongoing application of the gospel must take place in our hearts. Jesus, uh, uh, Paul holds up Jesus as a model and says in humility, if you look at Christ, your attitude should be like his, who in humility consider one another better than yourselves, I dare not come into church and say, this must be about me. In humility, I must consider one another better than myself, Paul says to the Philippians, and I must look not only to my own interests, but to the interests of others. You see, a theological student from Zimbabwe makes this insightful point. He says, slavery is a system of bossing people around. If Paul had bossed Philemon, the slave master might submit and grudgingly free Onesimus, but the principle of domination would still be intact. Instead, Paul subverts the entire system of domination by appealing to Philemon's free decision to act in a manner consistent with the equality and love between brothers and sisters in Christ. The gospel calls you to do that. We could coerce you and browbeat you, but the gospel calls us. You know, in South Africa, the government forces us with external rules to undo the legacy of apartheid by the commands of labor laws, by the commands of BEE, by the duties of political correctness. But what of our hearts? What of our hearts? Is everything okay there? Is there somebody that needs help? Fine. Right, it's just another chair that's broken. It's random. When it's your time, it's your time. <laughs> but it's the first time it's been, been that chair. It's like the guy who was flying in the airplane and uh, you know, he was really afraid of flying. And uh, you know, then uh, he said, you know, I, 
his friend next to him said, just calm down, you don't have to worry, you know, when it's your time, it's your time. He said, that's not what I'm worried about, what if it's the pilot's time? So, <laughs> so thanks, we are looking into the chairs, and that's a complete digression and one little extra joke on the fly. So where were we? We were in a, in a serious point. Because we have these external laws in our country of labor laws, BEE, the duties of political correctness. But I want to ask about our hearts. Because even those things can still reveal bitterness in our hearts. Isn't it tragic that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that's supposed to work from the inside out then has so little effect on God's people, so little effect on the church, so little effect on us to undo the legacy of inequality. The gospel has to change bitter hearts as well as bitter behavior. C.S. Lewis once said, we all agree that forgiveness is a beautiful idea, don't we? It's a beautiful idea. We think this is a high virtue, what a beautiful idea. But Lewis says, we all agree that forgiveness is a beautiful idea until we have to practice it. Ouch. Until we have to practice it. Why? Because I want to be forgiven. I don't want to know people are holding stuff. Why can't you let go of the past as it relates to me? But do I want to do the same? It's hard. It's very hard. We sit in our Bible studies, we say forgiveness is great until there's an actual real scenario called Anisimus and Philemon. Then it's hard. David Garland said, some people believe that Christianity only needs to change what we believe. The letter to Philemon makes it clear that it also needs to change how we treat other people. So look at verse nine. Uh, Paul says, I then as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. I mean, just, just imagine Onesimus arriving back in Colossae. I've no doubt that some of the neighbors saw him coming. Maybe they, they, they ran immediately to Philemon and said, you'll never believe it. Your long lost slave has come home. Do you want me to warm up the branding iron? Let's do that. Let's put those letters on his head. Let him be made a spectacle. I mean, he escaped here. We're gonna have uprising from the rest of the slaves. What's the rest of your household gonna say, Philemon? And I imagine Anisimus bowed down in fear, maybe trembling. He's just offering this letter from Paul to his boss. And Philemon opens it and he says, what, this is from the apostle Paul? Paul is asking me a favor? The Apostle Paul, who was a tent maker, who never wanted to be a burden on the church, who never asked for favors, who didn't want to do anything, that, he's asking me for a favor now? What is this? And there's Onesimus down on the ground, not sure if he's gonna be whipped or beaten. And then Philemon reads these words from Paul, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. I appeal to you for him, show my son kindness. He's my son. He became a Christian while I was in chains. And the only other person the Apostle Paul ever called his son in the Lord was Timothy, who was with him at this time. That's why he puts him in the letter. He says, Philemon, Timothy, and Onesimus are on the same level. They are both my sons. They are both brothers. Paul, in an amazing way, is elevating the status of, of, of Onesimus. Now the question we might have, and that's troubled people over the years, is why didn't Paul just speak out more loudly against abolishing slavery? And it's a massive question, it's a complex question, and I've made the decision not to tackle that, and I encourage you to read on that. Yes, people have used and abused the book of Philemon to actually support slavery, but I think you'll, you'll, you'll see it does the exact opposite. But Paul is doing something here, and he's introducing a new relationship. There are lots of things I sense as I read this that are on Paul's tongue, but he doesn't utter them because he, this is a personal letter. He's not writing some massive publication. It's a personal letter. He's trying to pursue his brother's heart. But I want to say that when Paul wrote Galatians 3.28, it was like a pebble that he dropped into the river of history. And Galatians 3.28 and even the book of Philemon started a ripple that moved out and I believe 
came to fruition in the abolishment of slavery, at least as we understand it in the new world. But slavery is, is, is still alive and well, brothers and sisters, and, and trafficking of human beings, and, and we could go on. But Paul wrote Galatians 3.28 and said, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And that stone went in, and it is continuing to ripple outwards. Look at verse 11. Paul says to Philemon, formerly Onesimus was useless to you, but now he's become useful both to you and me. And there's a play on words here. I wonder if you know that Onesimus in the Greek means useful. That's the dehumanizing slave name he was given. Who cares what his name actually was? He was called, maybe by Philemon or some other boss he'd had before, he was called useful. Well, let's at least hope he'll be useful. And so he was given the name useful. But when Onesimus ran away, he was useless to Philemon. And Paul acknowledges that. He's operating from that worldview. And now Onesimus in Christ has become truly useful to both Paul and to Philemon. And so Paul finds himself in this dilemma we spoke about. Uh, On the one hand, Onesimus has become this beautiful ministry partner. Paul's an older man at this point. He's a prisoner of Christ Jesus, we saw. And as this old man, maybe Onesimus was taking care of some of his needs. Maybe he was helping him preach the gospel. Maybe he was running errands for him. And if he sends him back, he's going to lose him. But if he keeps Onesimus, he'll be breaking Roman law. He'll risk damaging the relationship. How's it going to go with the Colossian church and with Philemon if they discover Paul's harboring a fugitive? What should he do? So he makes the decision in verse 12 to send him back. And he says, I'm sending him who is my very heart, there's the same word, I'm sending him, he's my very bowels. I'm sending my bowels back to you. Doesn't sound like a very good gift, (laughs) but but it is if we understand the culture of the depth of emotion, the, the most inward place, that's what I'm sending back. I'm not sending back a slave, I'm sending back a piece of myself. Philemon, Uh, when you see him and you look into his eyes, you see me, I've had to wrench out my heart. I've had to send my heart back to you. I'm torn. This has cost me. That's how much Paul loved Onesimus. And there are always risks in doing what you believe is the right thing. Paul's taking a massive risk in sending Onesimus back. Maybe it's because he knows what kind of man Philemon is and, and this gentle pleading and the gospel, will, 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 the light will go on. Maybe that's what he's hopes in, in the gospel. But I think it's Onesimus that's taking the biggest risk of all. I mean, things could go really bad. Things could be worse. There were obviously reasons why he ran away originally. Now he's gonna go back and, and who knows? An unknown future at the mercy of his master and think about what must have been running through his mind. I used all this skill, all this resource, all this courage to escape and I managed to get all the way to Rome and I'm gonna willingly walk back into Colossae, bow the knee and give up my freedom to an unknown future. Yo, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of winning his master over, That shows you the depth of what the gospel had done in Onesimus' life. Will his master respond? Verse 13, Paul again reiterates, I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place, Philemon, in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. There's a beauty in Paul's diplomacy here and just just his tactfulness again. He's saying, Philemon, the amazing thing is that God ordained it that Onesimus would actually take your place. When he was caring for me, it was as though you were caring for me. And I didn't want to presume on your kindness by just keeping him, and that would have forced you to have to make a decision. So I'm sending him back. The ball's in your court. I want you to be willing from the heart to be rooted in what the gospel has done. Can you do this? For both you and Onesimus, the gospel is doing something. Will you come to the table? And in fact, Philemon, verse 15, perhaps, just perhaps, the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good. To have him back as a brother forever, not just in this life, but for eternity. Whenever the, uh, Paul uses the passive tense in his letters, it's evidence that God is at work behind the scenes, and this is passive here. The reason he was separated, uh, there's something going on here. <clears throat> 
He thought he was running away to find freedom. And in fact, God met him through the Apostle Paul and he found an even deeper freedom. God brought our paths together. God, Philemon, is working not only in Onesimus' life, not only mine, he wants to work far more than you can imagine in your life and in the life of the Colossian church. Verse 15, that you might have him back for good and then into verse 16, here it is. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. This is incredible. Paul is saying Onesimus' primary identity is no longer as a slave. In fact, he says his identity now, he's a man. He has rehumanized him. He's saying he's not a living tool. He's not a subhuman. He's a human being created in the image of God. And he's, he's back. He's a man. And more than that, he's actually your brother. He's your brother. Philemon, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? See, friends, this letter shows us what good theology looks like when it's truly applied in practice. And down through history, a lot of people didn't really like the book. I think it's a sadness that we've forgotten it too because it challenges us. But down through history, people said, why did this get into the canon of scripture? Why did this form part? I mean, what, we, we want the book of Romans, we want grand theology. What do I wanna know about two people and their little saga somewhere off in, 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 in some small town called Colossae? But friends, that's the danger is that we have this grand theology but we never apply it. And this is so beautiful, God brings us a theology of reconciliation in in Paul's theology and now we have this book which shows us this is what it does in the hard knocks of life with two real people who are worlds apart and whose, whose society and culture says should not associate with each other at this level. You see, people are happy with theology when it stays up in the clouds but let the gospel talk to racism and privilege and power and prejudice and it's a whole different story because we're happy to leave it there. A Christian status as a member of God's family trumps all other distinctions we may have. I don't know what your primary identity used to be but when you're in Christ, you have a new primary identity and all the things we say divide us, they're still part of our identity, we don't ignore them, we don't just pretend we can't see the differences, they're still there but That's a secondary identity that gets consumed in a greater identity in Christ because a slave and master are now worshipers in the same church. How's that gonna work out in that culture? I remember in my previous church when I had the privilege of being in the same church as my gardener, we would stand at the tea table there chatting to one another and people say this is a little bit strange but don't you think when you worship in the same church as a person that's serving you in some way, it affects what you pay them, it affects the conversations, it affects the interest you have in their family. Why, because we're brothers, not seeing him in a different light. And must the gospel come and only change Onesimus into being a better slave? Perhaps that's what we thought in the apartheid era. You know, the gospel can just make people into better slaves. Surely the gospel must also change Philemon. Because if the gospel doesn't change how we relate as white and black and rich and poor and male and female and foreigner and local and oppressor and oppressed, then the gospel has failed. Brothers and sisters, we're saying man-made systems in society, societal constructs are greater than the power of the gospel to set us free and to reconcile us. We're admitting that man's hatred is stronger than God's love in the gospel. And Scott McKnight says the church is to be the first space of reconciliation in our communities, the first among its own people, and second as reconciled people who strive for reconciliation in society. Reconciled people become agents of reconciliation because they know no other way. Churches form the vanguard of creating a place where those deemed by the world and society and culture as unequals will be welcomed. Not in terms of the world, but in terms of being in Christ. The church generates a new way of life. He calls it Christoformity. Christoformity. Christians enter into society and in the world to become agents that subvert slavery in our world by finding it, naming it, fighting against it, and by embodying a way of life that establishes social equality as the grounds for the new communities in Christ. And so Paul comes out now in verse 17 and says, so if you consider me a partner, 
If you consider to be in fellowship with me, the word's koinonia, if you think we're partners, that we're together in Christ, then Philemon, welcome him, welcome Anesimus, as you would welcome me. Do for him what you'd do for me, if you would set the table for me, if you'd get the, the, the brand new duvet out and put it in the guest room, do it for him. If you consider me to be your partner, then welcome him as you'd welcome me as an equal. But the thing that struck me is that Philemon, he's commended as a good Christian leader and yet there's this massive blind spot because he lives with a cultural lens that doesn't even see that slavery is not normal. I think something like 40% of the population would have been slaves. So to, 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 to see people as equals would be like us giving up our vehicles and our tools and all of those things because they literally saw them as, as tools and as vehicles to be used. So would the gospel change Philemon's view of slavery and change his view of Onesimus? Only time will tell. Would he be willing to go against the cultural tide? Would he go against what the law said? Brand your slave. Would he go against that and what his neighbors thought? What would it mean for his other slaves? They'd, they'd be revolting. Maybe they were cross with Anesimus. Think how hard their lives would have been after, after he ran away. Maybe they were treated more cruelly or more harshly. What about the precedent he'd set? What if they all feigned Christianity so that they could get a, just a little get out of jail free card? There's all sorts of complexities if he obeys this. What about his church? People in his church would complain, uh, Philemon, we came to your house and joined this church because it didn't have any slaves in it. Now it does. Uh, I'm sorry. We, we thought we were coming to a church that just preached grand theology that wouldn't apply to the tough, difficult social situations. Well, we don't want a church like that. But Paul wants Philemon to figure it out. He doesn't tell him. There's these things on the tip of his tongue, but he leaves it with him. And you and I have to figure it out too. Paul simply says in verse 18, if he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. This is huge. Whatever the amount he stole, whatever revenue you lost with him being away, maybe you had to replace him with another slave, who, who knows? Paul says, I'm willing to take on the bets, on, on the debts. Do you know anybody who'd be willing to take on all the debt of somebody else? I don't know anyone. And then you think Paul was willing to take on all the debts, not just of anyone, but of a runaway slave. Whatever you've done, I don't even know what it is, I'll take it on because I don't want money to cloud the issue of gospel reconciliation. And Paul was a tent maker, he had some resources, he had finances for his own ministry, and so he makes his intention legally binding in case Philemon thinks, well, this is just a nice way of hinting, but he doesn't really want to. Paul says in verse 19, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. Here it is, here's my signature. Compare it, if you think it's a hoax, look at the letter to Colossians, look at my other letters. This is me, I stand by it, my I owe you. That's how much I believe in the cost of reconciliation because reconciliation always costs. Forgiveness always costs someone. And he says, not to mention that you owe me your very self. How on earth could Philemon read this and not be moved to some measure of emotion and tears as he thought, oh, the Apostle Paul's the one that led me to the Lord. He's the one that shared the gospel. He's the one that set me free from my chains. I owe him my very self. So Paul says in verse 20, I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Philemon, as you've done before and refreshed others, won't you refresh my heart now in this new, even difficult scenario? God's spirit lives in you. You're a Christian. Therefore, I can count on this. Surely the gospel's changed you. Surely I can be confident of your obedience and, and surely I can be sure that you'll do even more than I've asked. Perhaps this is a subtle hint that Paul hoped he would set him free. I feel like it's on the tip of his tongue but he doesn't utter it but he, he wants him to, to recognize, won't you do even more than what I'm asking? Don't just welcome him back, maybe send him back to me, free. And that's what the gospel should do. It should put us in a frame of mind not to just do our duty. The Christian who just says, what's the letter of the law? That's what I'm doing, not one single milligram more. We'll never know true biblical delight. Delight comes from doing more and loving more and saying, God, how can I serve you above and beyond? How can I love my brothers above and beyond? To go further, to give more. And I think the brevity, the shortness of this letter is evidence that Paul didn't want to cajole and whip Philemon into shape. He just said, 
Here's a small little thing. I'm just going to leave it with you. And that's my prayer. That as we leave this little letter, that, that that's all. That you won't feel browbeaten and coerced. I leave it with you. But there's a PS. Verse 22. Paul says, and one thing more. Prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. I'm hoping that God will set me free from my chains, that he'll use your prayers to get me to see you. And then you know what? I'm gonna be in your home. I want to see the beauty of what gospel reconciliation looks like. I wanna see it with my own eyes. That must have also been a sobering accountability. And Paul then ends the letter with some final greetings from various people that I won't read or go into. And in verse 25, he says, the grace, here it is again, grace at the beginning, grace at the end, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit because you cannot do this in your own strength, it has to be grace at work within you. So can I ask you, what do you think happened? Did Philemon forgive Onesimus? Did he perhaps send him back to Paul? The New Testament is silent. I wish I could tell you that I had discovered a letter uh, written from Philemon to Paul Dear Paul, I have received your letter to let you know that you have received this because Onesimus has brought brought it to you. He's a free man. Receive him in joy. Amen. Great conclusion. But the New Testament is silent. So can I ask you what you would have done if you were Philemon in that culture? What would have happened in New World slavery if one of those slaves on those plantations in the U.S. had gone to his boss with a letter like this? Think back to the apartheid days. What would have happened if someone went to their boss with a letter? It's, it's what would you do? And it's not hypothetical. It, it, in a spiritual figurative sense, here is Onesimus on the floor, knelt down before us. He, he's a picture of what gospel reconciliation could look like in our church. And you in your hand right now hold the word of God. You have this letter and you've read it. And you have a decision to make. What will you do to pursue reconciliation in our church? How will the story end? Well, brothers and sisters, I do have some incredible news. And I trust that this will wow you as much as it wowed me. 50 years after this letter to Philemon was written, there was a Christian martyr by the name of Ignatius. He was being marched to Rome to be executed. And you can read the account of his life. When he got to a place called Smyrna, he had the opportunity to write a letter, and that letter has been preserved and recorded for us in history. You can Google it and you can read the translation of Ignatius' letter. And in this letter, Ignatius writes about a wonderful bishop, a pastor, in the city of Ephesus. He calls him, in the letter, a man of inexpressible love. And do you know what the bishop's name is? Anesimus. Onesimus. And the evidence seems to suggest that the bishop of Ephesus 50 years on was the very same Onesimus because of the way that Ignatius describes him. And at this time he would have been about 70 years old because maybe he was 20 years old when, when he ran away. And this is incredible. Onesimus, once a slave, becomes a brother, now becomes the bishop, the pastor of Ephesus. And he does so after Timothy dies. Tradition tells us that Timothy was the bishop of Ephesus. And when he dies, Onesimus, Paul's second son in the Lord, takes over. That means that Philemon must have released him. And when I discovered this, I got such a lump in my throat. And I just thought, Lord, this is the grace of God. That these are the pieces that's going on here. And you sovereignly, these people meet this letter. uh, And here he becomes a pastor. That's the providence of God. But friends, there's more. Like a good salesman, I must tell you, there's more. Can you believe it? (laughs) Scholars believe, some scholars believe that it was in Ephesus that 10 of Paul's letters were compiled and published. And that took place at this exact time in history. So some scholars believe it would have been Onesimus who went and visited the various churches, found the original letters of the Apostle Paul, took them back to Ephesus, collected them and compiled them, and published them into what we have as our New Testament today. And you know what? Onesimus had hung on to this letter to his boss Philemon all these years because his boss had said, take it. This is a picture of God's grace in reconciling us. And you know what? I think Onesimus said, Let me slip this in to the New Testament. 
because it's the only personal letter we have from Paul. Uh, many scholars can't explain, well, well, how did this one end up there? I think it's because Onesimus put it in there because it was an incredible story of God's grace to him that only the gospel can bring about. Perhaps Onesimus is the unsung hero of the New Testament, featured in a book we never read, and without him we wouldn't even have much of the New Testament. To forget Onesimus is to forget grace and reconciliation. To forget Onesimus is to hold on to bitterness and unforgiveness. Onesimus thought he was running away, but God found him and changed his life, the life of his slave boss, and the life of that church at Colossae. Can I ask you, if God can do that for a fugitive, do you think he could do it for you? You are like Anesimus. You think you can run away? You think you can go to your Rome that's anonymous and no one knows what's going on in that corner of your life? But God does. And God is pursuing you. Jesus came to seek and save the lost and you are here today not by accident because God's pursuing you, hearing the sermon and it's not an accident. Your punishment is sure, your guilt is great, but an advocate comes to your rescue. There is one interceding for you. There is one who has written a letter to the Father and said, Father, please forgive them. There is one who said, charge it to me, Father. All their debt, all their sin, charge it to me. And he hung upon that cross and he was branded a thief and a criminal. He was whipped and he was bruised and he carried the scars in his body so that you could be reconciled to God. So you can keep running, my friend, if you want to, but God will keep pursuing you until you reconcile to God, and he'll keep pursuing you until you are reconciled to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's pray together. Oh Lord Jesus, as we think about you being whipped and spat upon, you the suffering servant, suffering in our place, that you would not just become a man, but you'd become less than a man, you'd become a slave. A slave and be crucified even upon a cross. Oh Lord, may what you've done for us, may the grace of the gospel transform us, Lord, in recesses of our soul where we think we can run and hide. Lord, I pray that you'd use this word, a book that we've forgotten, a book that we've neglected, maybe because we're afraid to go there, maybe we're afraid of the implications. Won't you bring this book to life again in our midst, in our congregation, that like the Colossian church, we would receive this letter and the letter to the Colossians as the word of God, and may we be changed by it. O Lord, do new things in us. Help us to see your hand of mystery woven through our lives that, that maybe, Lord, you even put the seed in Anesimus' mind for him to run away, and yet you use that, Lord, and sometimes even seeds that are in our mind and our motives are not pure. Lord, you're able to turn around all of that for the good of the gospel. Thank you that in Christ you are with us, that in Christ we can do all things. Lord, speak to us and keep speaking to us as we apply your word to the difficult spaces in our life. As we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.